yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap with flames. Right, so today is, is again, we're, we're talking about the storage layer of the database system. So today's class is going to focus on how can we actually compress the, the database itself or the, the data we're dealing with. Um, so in last class was all about these, these different methods to, to avoid data when we do our scans um, via filters like the zone maps or using the, the bitmap indexes. Um, so today's class is really about, okay, well, if I do have to read the data, what can I do to, to, to keep it in a smaller form that's going to be more compact to, to accelerate things? So the reason why this is going to work is that we can take, take advantage of just the nature of what real data looks like uh, and see how it's going to be amenable to, for compression. So there's going to be two basic ideas that we can exploit. First is that the data sets are going to be highly skewed, meaning we're going to see the same values over and over and over again in our columns. And that's going to be a, a, ripe, for, uh, a ripe target for, for compression. So the, the classic example always is this thing called the Brown Corpus. Um, in the 1960s at Brown University, some researchers basically looked at the entire collection of what they thought was uh, emblematic of, of, of literature in the English language, Shakespeare and stuff like that. And they literally just counted the, the occurrence of each word in all these different documents. Right? And what was the most common word? The. The, right? Wow. What's the second most common word? A, A right? <laughs> but what they found was that the, 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 second, the second most common word appeared half as many times as the, as the, the, the first most common word. And the third appeared the, the second, or half as much as the, the second. Right? So there's this parallel distribution. Real data looks like that. Look, looks like that. So we're going to be able to exploit that when we do compression. We're also going to see uh, uh, highly correlated values uh, where, the, where we know that if a value is in one column, it's going to appear the same. Or sorry, if for a given value in one column, it's very likely to have a, a value within some small range in another column. So again, classic example would be a zip code to the city. Right? If I know your zip code, then I, I, I'm going to know what city you're in, the high probability. Right? So the, the real data looks like it's all, in, in, you know, always looks like it's going to have this kind of skew. And this is why we're going to be able to get, get results in compression. So and sort of goes, you know, obviously, that the, if we can compress the data, we can reduce its size and increase the amount of utility or usefulness or, information, or useful information we're going to be able to extract from data as we read it. The reason why we want to do this is because traditionally, disk or the network is always going to be the main bottleneck when we execute queries. So if for you know, one megabyte of data or one, one, or one gigabyte of data read from disk, if we can extract more tuples out of that one gig, then we would realize if it was uncompressed, then that's a huge win for us. Now, I say traditionally because the disk and network are getting very fast, uh, and CPU is less so. Um, and so the, in some cases, it actually with, with modern compression algorithms and modern hardware, you actually don't want to maybe just do blind, uh, you know, blind uh, naive compression over blocks of data. We still want to do the native database compression. We're, we're going to talk about this class. Uh, but it's, it, the advantage you would always get just by you know, running gzip or whatever, snappy, on, on the data when it's a block on disk, that isn't always the case. So we're going to see techniques how we can keep things, uh, we can still get the, the benefits of compression, but then actually speed up query execution by operating on directly compressed data. That's sort of where, where we're going today. But in, so that's why I'm saying traditionally. It isn't always the case. But again, we just want to get more bang for the buck for everything we read. And so there's going to be this key trade-off between speed and compression ratio um, where there may be cases where we can get amazing compression uh, and really reduce the size of, of, of data, but the computational overhead of compressing and decompressing it is going to make this uh, not a good trade-off, not a good choice. So we'll see this when we talk about naive compression. Uh, there's going to be algorithms like Facebook's Z standard that it's going to maybe not get as good compression as like gzip, but it's going to be computationally way faster. And therefore, that's the right trade-off in, in a database system. Right? Again, if, if we can operate directly on compressed data, then we'll be able to reduce the amount of DRAM, amount of, uh, amount of CPU overhead potentially, and get sort of all, all, you know, we get a lot of benefits of this. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about like, some basic background of, of data compression. 
We'll then talk about a na naive page compression scheme, which I think we talked about in the introduction class. Um, so last semester in the introduction class was the first time I talked about database compression uh, in the intro course. So some of this will be redundant, but we'll talk about more advanced things as we go along. All right, so we'll talk about basic naive compression. Then we'll talk about native co columnar compression. And this is what we want to, this is how we're going to get the benefit of, uh, this is how we're going to be able to operate directly on compressed data. If we, again, the data system natively does this. And then we'll finish up talking about, like, what do you do with intermediate data? Like, from, from one operator to the next, what can you compress? The answer is nothing uh, in general, but we'll, we'll, we'll see why. All right, so I've already said this before, uh, that the goal of, of database compression is that we want to reduce the, the size of the data we're actually storing, the tuples itself, um, so that for some amount of data that we're reading, either from the disk or network, that the amount of values we're going to be able to extract from it uh, we increase for some unit computation or I.O. So there will be three goals that we need to, need to have in any compression scheme we're using. The first is that we must produce fixed length values for everything. Because right? again, we're assuming we're storing things in a col columnar oriented for format. Everything has to be fixed length so that we can just do the simple arithmetic to jump to a given offset. Right? I want the 100th tuple in this column uh, and the next column. I know how to do the simple math so that they're always, I get, get to exactly where I, where I need. Uh, we want to have a lossless scheme. Again, we'll explain what that is on the next slide. But basically, for any data we go in, we need to get that same data out. Because otherwise, if, if, if we start losing things, people get pissed, or the database gets corrupted. And then ideally, which is not going to always be the case, we want to postpone having to decompress the data for as long as possible during query execution. So that means we want to be able to, if, if possible, operate directly on compressed data to do our predicate evaluation. That way you can check to see whether something matches or not. And if it does match, then we maybe you know, go ahead and decompress it. Ideally, it would be nice to be able to ride compressed data all the way up to the query plan. But as I said, no, nobody supports that. Nobody can do that. And you know, we'll, we'll see why as we go along. All right. So these two are definite. This one, ideally, not always the case. Uh, but again, beyond the scan operator, not much you can do. So lossy versus lossless is sort of obvious. And I think we might have touched on this a little bit last class. Um, but all the compression schemes we're going, to be, we're going to be using about has to be lossless. Because like as I said, people don't like to lose data. What's an example of a, uh, of a lossy compression scheme? The most probably famous one? JPEG. JPEG, MP3, MP4, right? And the reason why these things work, because the, us as humans, since we're the ones consuming the audio because we listen to it or see the, the, visu the, you know, the visual image in the, in the JPEG, like we can't detect things like the bits being, uh, some bits being removed, right? We still see what we, what, what we appear to be the original image, or we still hear what we think is the original audio. Databases are, are it's, it's computer software, so we can't do that. So we start throwing away bits, uh, you know, people, people can potentially start noting this, or the data system is not going to be able to read any, any kind of data. So any kind of lossy compression has to be done at the application level, because the database system doesn't know what is OK to throw away. So a simple example would be uh, of, of a lossy compression scheme would be, say I have this, like, uh, I'm keeping track of the temperature in this room, and I don't care about knowing exactly what was the temperature at some given timestamp from five months ago, six months ago. So what I'll do is I'll just take, compute the average for the temperature of a room in one hour chunks. So that's a lossy scheme, but it still gives me the, the sense of what the data should be. The data system can't know that. Uh, all those kind of those operations have to be done at the application level, right? Now, last class, we also talked about maybe you doing a process of query processing where we're sampling data to produce approximate results. That's basically the same thing. Uh, it, it sort of achieves the same thing, but in that case, again, the, the, we still have the original data, just we're, we're sampling it, all right? All right. So, there's a bunch of design systems we're, we're going to have to uh, deal with when we want to decide we want to add compression to our database system. And this obviously is like, what are we going to compress? How are we going to compress it? What is the scope of, of what we're going to look at compression? So we sort of need to look at all these things, and then we'll see why uh, we'll, we'll make some decisions now, and then that'll infer how we, make, how we decide what's the right compression scheme to use in, uh, in when we talk about the columnar compression, right? So the first thing we got to deal with, again, is, is what the granularity of what we're trying to compress. So the first choice is to do it at the block level. This would be like a row group when we talked about packs before. Right? Some chunk of, of, of tuples, not the entire table, but some, some subset of it. 
right? The next would be you can actually compress within a single tuple itself. So this would be like in a row store. So think of like I'm taking the entire tuple itself, um, and I'm going to run some compression scheme on just that tuple. And, I don't, I don't, and every single tuple will be compressed in a different way, potentially. I can do compression within a single attribute. Uh, so this would be like if I have a really large, I have a column that has a really large, uh, has a really large text field or a binary field. Maybe I want to run you know gzip or snappy on, on, that, on that, that individual value for every single tuple. Right? Postgres does this in their, in their toast tables. Um, and then I can do it on, on a column level. And this is what we're going to be mostly focused on. Well, where, well, it's going to be column level plus block level. But we're going to take the, the entire column itself and run our compression algorithm on, on that. Different systems do different things. All the column store systems that we're focusing on this semester, right, they're going to do block level but within a column. Um, MySQL can do tuple level. I, I, sorry, that's incorrect. MySQL does block level on, on a page. Uh, Postgres can do uh, attribute level for, for, like for, for really large var chars. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so like, yeah, I figured out he was dead and I just, we just left, right? And I let the cops deal with it. It wasn't my problem. What's that? Okay. All right, so the, the, the first scheme will be so we'll call it naive compression. And again, the idea here is that the, it's, it's going to be opaque to the database system. It's going to be some external algorithm that the data system doesn't know about, doesn't know, doesn't know how to interpret what the bytes are after it's been compressed. Again, think of just like you run gzip locally. Right? It's, it's some block of data, you run gzip on it, and the data system doesn't know what's inside of it. It just says, here's the bytes that represent some amount of data. And as I said before, we don't want to use gzip because gzip is going to be, uh, it's going to get a great compression ratio. Uh, 7z is probably better, but like, it's, it's going to be super slow for our databases. So instead, we're going to use these, these category of these sort of based on the LZO stuff um, came in the 90s. But all of these, for broadly, are, are variations of this, where we're going to make a trade off we're not having as, as good compression ratio in exchange for getting uh, faster decodes, right? And so Snappy came out of Google. Uh, that's pretty widely used in modern OLAP systems. I probably should this broadly from Facebook. It's, it's meant for compressing HTML documents like on the web. So there's, it, has, it has some magic there because it knows like there's an HTML, there's a header, like the, the structure of the HTML document compress things. Oracle has their own version of compression called OZIP. What's interesting about this is that for a while when they were actually, they bought Sun Microsystems, they, had, they were selling Spark chips. In the Spark instruction set, they actually put uh, OZIP uh, instructions in there. So like there's hardware accelerated compression. Uh, but that doesn't exist anymore. The, right now, the gold standard is, is Z standard. Right? This is considered the state of the art from Facebook. I think there's, there's newer versions of it. It's gotten better since 2015. But this is what, this is, has the best performance versus compression ratio trade-off. Uh, and this is what everyone should use. All right, so let's go see now, uh, let's see how you would do sort of naive compression and MySQL. And we'll see, again, the disadvantages of why we're actually not going to want to do this for, uh, for our column stores. And I'll say also, too, you can take the, you can combine these different compression schemes together. So I could do the, the dictionary compression that we're going to talk about in a second on a column. But then that generates a giant PAX file. And then I just run Z standard on top of that. Uh, I don't have graphs to show here. I can sh share on Piazza. But like, as the disk gets faster, you actually don't want to do that. So you still want to do the native compression that the, that the, the the data system is going to support, but you don't want to then run additional compression on top of that. So you can like kind of compress a compressed file. Like you try to run gzip on MP3 or MP4, it's not it's not going to make a big difference. And you but you pay the CPU cost. All right. So the way MySQL does this is that you would declare a table would be compressed uh, in, in like a table option, the, the the engine options, and then when everything's on disk, it's always going to be uh, in a compressed format. And the pages are either going to be one, two, four, eight uh, kilobytes. And so the idea here is like they want to make sure that the pages can can easily fit into slots on disk, and that way you have a bunch of holes. So they always round up to the to, to the next largest page size. So if my if my page is one point five kilobytes, they'll just round it up and pad it out to to two kilobytes. And at the header of each page, there'll be a fixed length mod log, where it's a place where you can do updates uh, or insertions into the page without having to decompress it first. And then now when you go, uh, when you go to consolidate and write it out to disk, then you, you apply the change. Uh, so maybe actually, I actually don't know whether they actually store it on disk. When you bring in memory, you're going to have this. It's like a buffer space. So you can apply changes without having to decompress it first. Right? 
All right, so now if I, if I need access to page in memory, uh, I'm always going to copy it in and then in its compressed format. Uh, and I'm going to try to do as much reading as I can from it if it's, uh, if it's compressed, because uh, it might be some header stuff. But like, if I actually have to read the data, then I have to decompress it. But the mod log can absorb the, any, any changes or updates. So all writes go into the mod log. At some point, if I need to know what's inside of it, then I have to decompress it. And I still maintain the compressed version uh, for, for bookkeeping reasons. But now, once I have it uncompressed, then I can do whatever, I can do whatever, uh, you know, do any, any reads and writes that I want. If I don't modify it, I need to save space, then I can blow away this and then still keep this in, in there. Right? And so the, the uncompressed page is always, in my SQL, the default is 16 kilobytes. So in memory, uncompressed is always 16 kilobytes, but it could be you know, some, smaller, uh, some smaller size on disk. Yes? So uh, can you perform any operations on the compressed page as is? His, his question is, can you perform any operations on, on the compressed page as is? No, I can't. If I need to read the value of a tuple, Right. Like, is there any metadata that's useful? Though? Is there any? He's the question. Is there any metadata that's useful? Uh, I think you can get the number of pages, or sorry, the number of tuples that are inside of it. Um, I say also too. So this is also uh, this is MySQL InnoDB. So it's the the pages themselves. Assuming these are data pages, these are like the leaf notes of the B plus tree. So you know something about the B plus tree structure when you get here. So you may be able to de de derive some things. Right? But the main thing about it, I can do updates easily. Actually, I can do updates in, in the uncompressed form. And then anytime I do a read, in theory, I could, if I say, does this value exist, I could, I could do look in the, the mod log without decompressing it. If I find the thing I'm looking for because someone updated it before, then, then I can get the result back. Oh, I was just going to say that I think that the mod log contains metadata as the org. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, so again, this is just this is one way to do this. Uh, this is what MySQL does. Um, the Postgres doesn't doesn't do this, except for, again, the toast is a separate thing. So there's some obvious disadvantages of this. Uh, so we have to decompress everything anytime we want to access, like actually read it and potentially modify it, um, and then. Even if the, the sort of naive compression scheme we're using, underneath the covers is using dictionary encoding, like something like Z standard. The, 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 the dictionary itself is not exposed to the database system. So therefore, we can't use the dictionary to, 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 to do some predicate evaluation or, or, or answer some queries. Because again, it's opaque. We don't know what's actually in the binary uh, compressed data. right? But if we maintain the dictionary ourselves, then there, there are some, some performance benefits we can get when we do query evaluation. Right? The other key thing about this, too, is like the, this, these, this compression scheme is basically it's naive, meaning like it doesn't consider anything about the, what, the, what the, the, the meaning of the queries are that you want to need to operate on it. Can't reason about like what are the, the, the data types, what are the query I'm trying to execute. I have to blindly just decompress everything and then run the query. So the only advantage you're really getting uh, in this case here, I'm going back, is I can read one kilobyte instead of, instead of 16 kilobytes, potentially. Right? So if we can operate directly on compressed data, then we, we still have to read the compressed data from disk, but maybe we don't want to actually materialize the results. We can operate, you know, we, we just do our predicate evaluation directly on the compressed data, and it's going to be way faster. So that's the key idea of what we want to show in columnar compression. That is there a way to encode the data in such a way that we may be able to operate it directly you know, without having to decompress everything first. We sort of saw this last class when we talked about the bit weaving stuff. And, and bitmap indexes are essentially the, you know, another way to compress things as well. Like I could, I could represent data in a smaller form and get more bang for the buck for, for any amount of CPU time I'm spending on, on the system or a, in processing the data. So we're going to go through a bunch of these different examples. Uh, and we'll see in some cases, these things can be combined together. Uh, so run length encoding is super common. And that's oftentimes used in, in combination with dictionary coding and other things. Dictionary coding overall is going to be the most common approach. So we'll spend time talking about what that actually looks like. Bitmap encoding will be an extension of what we talked about last class for bitmap indexes. But we'll look to see if there, is there are more compact representations that we can use for the bitmaps themselves. Delta coding is sort of obvious. And then bitpacking will be the. Um, 
be the last one. Okay? All right. All right, so run length encoding. It's exactly as it sounds that the idea is that we're going to be able to compress. If we have uh, repeated values for, for long strides in our data, then instead of having to store the exact same value over and over and over again, instead we can just say, we can store a summary of it. Say, for this given value at this starting position in our column, here's how many occurrences there are of it. And ideally, that would again be, be some compact form of, of the data. So to get the most benefit of this, uh, you're going to need to sort the, the data ahead of time. Um, but this gets tricky because if you sort it versus one key versus another key, that could affect the, the efficacy of run length encoding. Um, but in general, pe people usually sort in the primary key because uh, it's, it's good enough. This is sometimes called in null suppression in the literature. It's basically the same idea, but it's like instead of just tracking any possible value, if you say how many nulls that I have. Right? But the, the idea is basically the same thing. All right, so let's look at a simple example. So we have that same uh, data we had before. It's a list of people and whether they're lit or not. Um, so if I want to make a, if I want to do run length encoding on this, right, instead of storing yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, I'm going to have these, these triplets that say, here's the value, here's the, here's the offset where we are in the column. Sometimes that's not needed, but th for, for simplicity, assume it is. And then here's the length of the run, right? So we have three yeses in the first three attributes. So our triplet is value yes, offset zero, and followed by, and there's three of them. Right? So now if I have a query like this, uh, select count uh, star users group by lit, then I can rip through this pretty quickly because all I need to do is just, uh, just scan through this and just add, you know, add, add these up together for the different groups in my hash table when I'm do doing the, the aggregation. Right? So in this case here, we're not actually, it's, we're not actually getting better compression because what was simply you know, yes, no, if we could store that maybe in a single byte, um, we're actually now storing w way more data. And the reason is because we have these regions here where it's, it's a no followed by yes followed by no. Right? This is the worst case scenario for, for assuming two values. So run length encoding is actually not going to help us here. But if we sort the data just based on the lit column here, now we get it down to two triplets. Right? Here's all the yeses, and followed by the noes, and I don't have to store that twice. Right? I don't have the math here, but like, so this went from you know, some smaller bytes. Again, think there's only eight tuples here. Think of like, or 10 tuples. Think of like really large examples, right? Uh, if I can sort things ahead of time, then this would be, this'd be a huge win. So a lot of, a lot of data is actually going to look like this. So it just depends on whether you can actually sort it or not. Okay. So RLE, we're going to see in a bunch of different cases combined with the other ones. So the basic premise, very few systems, as far as I know, are going to do, like, on a column by itself, run RLE. Vertica probably is the most aggressive about this because they want to pre-sort columns ahead of time. Uh, but we'll see this in dictionary encoding and, and other things, right? All right. And again, that's why, I'm, even though dictionary encoding is the most common, I'm showing RLE first because then we can, uh, we can apply it. Uh, we can apply RLE as necessary. All right. So the basic idea of dictionary compression is that we want to take f frequent values that occur in our column and we want to replace them with uh, a fixed length code just to represent as a placeholder for what that, that value represents. And there'll be this separate dictionary data structure we're going to maintain that we're going to use as a mapping from a given dictionary code back to its original value. Again, this is how the, the, all the column store systems are going to convert variable length strings into fixed length values because the dictionary values are going to be, the dictionary codes are always going to be fixed length. All right? So we're getting the benefit of, of with dictionary com compression, we're getting the benefit of compression, obviously, but now we're also getting the benefit of it now makes everything ni nicely aligned in our columns that w would otherwise not be. So typically, you're going to do uh, one dictionary code for each unique value. Uh, there are some schemes where you can do uh, n-gram comp compression, right? Instead of like within like the you know, three characters within the string, uh, each it has a own separate code, and you can concatenate them together, and that's the original code. Uh, most systems don't do that. It's usually like you know one code equals one one full value. So the yes. 
Her sta statement is, is sta it's a question or a statement, sorry. It's, a sta oh, it's like a question, it's a confirmation question. Yeah, so, so her question is, is, is dictionary coding really useful for strings? Absolutely yes, for, because everything becomes fixed length. That's right. But people still use it for, uh, for numeric, numeric columns as well. Or like for like a, if it was like a float, right? Yeah. And, and your floats are repeated a lot, mm -hmm. then yeah, you could, now you can represent the float as an integer, uh, presuming assuming it's order preserving, which we'll get that in a second. Like yeah. then now I can do comparisons on integers instead of comparisons on floats. Which is like faster. Yes, way faster. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think Park K and Orc both compress new dictionary encoding for for floats. Mm -hmm. um, Timestamps would be another one. Right. You can then do, if you, if you do, again, you can combine these things. If I'm doing delta encoding, uh, maybe instead of storing the, I can maybe store the code as a smaller thing and a, and a small, you know, small delta with together. Like, you, again, most bank, the, the largest portion of the data within real databases will be string data. And so you'll get a huge win for this, uh, but you can still use it for other things. Okay. okay. All right, so in deciding how we want to do dictionary coding, there's, there's four questions we, gotta, we have to answer. So first of all, like, when are we actually going to structure the dictionary? This is only is a, really an issue for if you want to support incremental updates in your database. For our purposes in this class, we we'll assume we're not, so that makes it easier. So when we create the file, the PACS file, the Parquet file, whatever, like the data, once, once we send the file, it's immutable, that's when we create the, the dictionary. Next question is what is the scope of the dictionary? Like how much, uh, are we looking at within you know, multiple tuples, a single tuple, uh, sorry, multiple columns, a single column within a block, within a file, similar to what we talked about before. Then the question is what data structure we're gonna use for the dictionary. If it's immutable, the answer is gonna be uh, an, uh, sort of an array, because that's the easiest. But if you want to, uh, if you want to support updates, we'll, we'll look how to use B plus trees for this. And then what's the encoding scheme? Like, so how are we gonna actually going to represent the, the dictionary codes, and then how can we do fast e encode and decode? All right, so go through these one by one. All right, so first is when, when are we actually gonna construct the dictionary? And as I said, it's either all at once, because like if the file's immutable, I'm gonna write out the disk, you know, then I populate the, the, the dictionary, or if I need to support um, updates and inserts to an existing file, then I have to support incremental updates. This is a lot harder because now you can imagine if my uh, if, I've, if, if I'm trying to preserve the ordering of, of the dictionary codes to mapping to their values, then if I have dictionary codes one, two, three, four, now I need to insert, insert something between three and four, I gotta readjust and, and rebuild my dictionary and, and re-encode everything. So the way to handle that is sometimes they just put gaps in, right? Extra, extra, extra space in the, or yeah, they leave empty space within the values, so that way someone does come and insert. You can still preserve the ordering of the values, the codes, without having to re-encode everything. This is much harder. Uh, DB2Blue does, uh, is pretty aggressive about this. We don't, we're not gonna cover this. Our focus is, is this semester is on this one, right? Again, I have all the data. I, I'm trying to pick the, the correct scheme for it. The next is the scope. Again, this is similar to what we talked about before, the granularity. So like, what will the dictionary represent? Like, What, what range of possible tuples in the table? Um, so a block level would just be within a single column. Here's all the attributes. So within a single column, here's all the values within, uh, within a single attribute within a block. Here's all the values for, the, for those tuples in that block. Um, now the problem with this one's gonna be that if I have different blocks that are part of the same table, if they each have their own dictionary, uh, now if I wanna do comparisons or maybe put them together into a single data structure, I always have to decompress them because the dictionary codes for the one block are not gonna be the same as the dictionary codes in the other block, and therefore I don't wanna have false, false positive of matching. So I have to I have decompress everything but when I combine, combine it together. So I'm building a hash table for a join. I, if I have multiple blocks, each are dictionary compressed. I can't, have, can't store the dictionary codes in my hash table because the same dictionary code might be repeated from one block to another. Uh, if it's doing table of compression, uh, we'll get great compression ratio because we're gonna see a lot of values over and over again. We don't have to store you know, we have to store the dictionary 
multiple times with the same, same mapping, the same code. But of course, as I said, if we have to update this, we have to put extra space to do, to maintain, uh, to, to extra room for it to absorb it and amortize inserts. Nobody does this, so we're not gonna talk about this, but you could do dictionary compression across multiple tables. Like I think I have foreign key columns that were the same value domain is from, it repeats in one column to the next. If I have a single dictionary for both of those, then I can get better compression ratio. But again, as far as I know, nobody does this. So again, for this semester, we'll assume it's gonna be this. All right, so what do we need to support in our dictionary? We need basically two operations. We need to encode and decode. So for a uncompressed value, we want to convert it to its compressed form. And we want to do this fast, fast as possible. Because again, we think of like, I'm bringing a block in, I, and I'm, I, I'm bringing a block of data in, I want to do a scan on it. I want to convert my predicate into the, the dictionary value because I want to operate directly on the compressed data. So I need a way to encode it. And then also too now, as I'm getting tuples that match my predicate in my scan operator, I want to be able to decode them very quickly. Right? So there isn't going to be a hash function that can do this for us. Right? Uh, that is going to be able to do both of these things, like go in both directions, and be fast and order preserving, which is the other thing we, we would care about as well. So this, we're basically going to have to maintain some data structure to do this for us. So here's why order preserving matters. So if we get order, if the, the dictionary codes, the ordering of the dictionary codes corresponds to the same ordering of the actual values that we're, we're compressing, then we can convert uh, our predicates and our queries to, the, to these dictionary codes and operate directly on compressed data. And in some cases, we can do some query rewriting and operate, execute the query directly on the dictionary itself without ever actually having to look at the real data. All right, so say I have, I have four strings here. Andrea, Wynn, Andy, and Matt. So if I sort the data, the original, the original data in the, in, the, in the column, and then I build dictionary codes that, where the dictionary code corresponds to the sort position of the original data, then now if my query comes along like this, select star from users where name like A and D with a wild card, then I can, I can just do the, uh, just to well, convert my query, the like calls, into a between 10 and 20, right? Because I know how to go uh, find, look in the dictionary, find A and D, and, and this would be the highest point, and this would be the lowest point. Then now I can just rip through the, the scanned data, or sorry, compressed data very quickly. So what, what would normally have to be a string match, which would be slow, now converts into a between calls on integers, which is fast. So that, that's why we want, to, we, want to, we want to have this order-preserving property. So it doesn't always work, though, right? So if I have like this, uh, then we still have the foreign sequential scan, but now we're performing, actually, sorry, this is with a name on it. Since I need to get back the original value, uh, I still have to do a sequential scan, but then convert it back anything that matches. But if I have a query like this, distinct name, then all I have to do is just operate directly on, on the dictionary apply my predicate with the between calls, and then pull out the, uh, you pull out the unique names. So again, like we can, like the, this is almost like a zone map where it's, it's a compressed representation of what's actually in the column. And in some cases, we only have to operate on this. We never have to look at the original data. So again, say I have four entries in my, in my dictionary, but I have a billion tuples in my column that's, that's being represented by these, these four, four dictionary entries. I could run this complex query directly just on four things instead of all one billion. Yes? When implementing so unique store to dictionary, what uh, value store does that So the statement is, uh, we, to do this, do we actually have to store two dictionaries? Do we have to store the value to code and code to value? Typically, they only store value to code. And then this is so small that like, you can just do a sequential scan on it quickly. I think Parquet does this, Arrow does this. There's another approach we'll see in a second uh, where it's actually a B plus tree. So then you can do the lookup, you can do lookup in both directions as you're, as you're talking about. Again, like we assume that the data is highly skewed, so there's gonna be repeated values uh, in, my, in, you know, in my column. So the dictionary, you know, I could have a, a billion tuples, but I'm gonna have some smaller percentage of 
potential values in my, in my dictionary. And if I'm organizing things on a block, which is like maybe one, like one meg, 10 megs or whatever it is, or 128 megs in like parquet, then this thing's not going to be that big. And it'll reside in L1, L2. All right. So I've already sort of alluded to this, the, the three different ways we can, we can rep represent this. The most common one is going to be an array, where it's just it, you take a bunch of variable and strings, you sort them, and then you just store them one after another in this array. And then the dictionary code is an offset, a byte offset into the, the array. So this is, this is the worst case scenario, if you, or this is the worst thing to do if you need to support updates. But again, if our files are immutable, then this is fine, right? Hash table would be another approach. The problem with this one, you can't do a range of prefix queries. So I don't know if anybody actually does this. This will just support faster, faster lookups, uh, potentially. Uh, and then the, the B plus tree, it's going to be much slower than, than these other approaches. It's going to take more, way more memory. But in some cases, we'll be able to support complex uh, range of prefix queries. But you'll see in a trick, they actually need to be, since they go need to both encode and decode, it's a complex data structure where the leaves of the B, B plus trees are shared between the two, two separate indexes. Well, this, we'll go through the first one and the last one. All right, so to do an array, the first thing we're going to do is just sort our data. Uh, and then store them in a dictionary that's, that's just uh, contiguous memory of, of the values. So there's always the prefix of how, how big the, the, the original value is, and then, then the actual value, and, the, and, then, and then there's the next one in the array. So now then we, in, our, in our compressed data, we just replace the, the actual value with an offset into this array. All right, it's pretty simple. And I said this, this is the most common one. This is what, uh, and th this is what Arrow uses. The, the B plus tree one with the shared leaves, the idea is that there's a B plus tree on the top that does encoding and a B plus tree on the bottom that does, does decoding. And then in between, you're sharing the, actually the, the, the leaf nodes. Um, so I, I can take an original value here and get back a encoded value, de encoded value, and do original value are coming back. Right? So I can go in both directions. We can ignore this. We'll incremental encoding. We're not going to discuss this. But basically, these, you can do additional compression on the contents of, of the leaf node as well. Like, it's not Z standard, but like you could think of like you could do other techniques here because now you know the data is sorted. Uh, there's sorted strings, and you can take advantage of that, All right? So I said before that in the case of like Z standard and there's not even compression schemes, the problem with using those, even though underneath the covers they're doing some variation of, of dictionary encoding, they don't expose the dictionary to the database system. So. With Parquet and Orc, they actually have the same problem. When you actually go look at their implementations, you can't actually, there's no command to, to pull out the, the dictionary to then use that for maybe encoding your predicate to do like predicate pushdown. You can do this with Arrow, you, but they basically do a copy of the dictionary instead of Parquet and then convert that into an Arrow format. But there's no way to do like zero copy direct access into the, to the dictionary, at least f from my understanding. So. Even though I made a big deal about how important it is to, to do native compression and, and maintain the dictionary ourselves, the most common two uh, kilometer formats, Parquet and Oric, don't actually let you do this. Um, there is talk that from Facebook's new, uh, Facebook has a new file format called Alpha uh, that they talk about in the Velox paper, we'll, we'll read later in the semester. Um, that you know, they're, they're, they fix this problem. And then for, at YouTube, there's a system called Priscilla uh, that has this other kind of file format called Arturus, or Artis, and they, they solve this problem as well. So it's, it's well known that you, you, know, th you want the database engine to be able to see the dictionary to do a bunch of the tricks that we talked about, but the most common ones don't actually do it. Just something to be mindful. Yes? For, for this one or, or for the array one? Uh, this one. Actually both. So for this one, the, the index is, I mean, so the index itself, like if you, if you want to decode a value, right? Mm -hmm. Go here, right? So I have an encoded value. I do a look at my index. Then it's going to point me to some offset inside of this, the leaf node here. And then I know, I know how to do, do the lookup, so right? So you do need something that, uh, that points us to a particular place, right? So you yeah, this, this is the B plus tree. This would point us to an offset here, get what you want. Where I'm go I thought you were going with is this one here, right? That like, 
there is no, we don't store the, the, the codes actually in here, right? So if I want to do, I want to encode, I have to do a sequential scan in this, although it's sorted, so you can do binary scan, but they're variable length, so now you've got to figure out where to jump. So it's, it's, you, you just have to do a sequential scan. Or you maintain something that says, here's the offsets for every single one, but that takes up space. I, I don't know if anybody does that. There's other things you can do, like put like a balloon filter in front of this and see whether actually the string you want is in there. And then, then if no, then you don't do the scan. Like you can combine all the things that we talked about before. But this is the most compact form, right? You can't get smaller than this. Lengthen the value, you know, stored continuously. Whereas if a hash table, you, you, you know, you maintain a hash table with empty space. Uh, if it's uh, if it's a V plus tree, same thing. But like those techniques would be useful if you want to support increment updates. If you don't want to support increment updates, you have all the data ahead of time, then this this is the best best approach. And then again, you can put a balloon filter in front of it. Okay. All right. So so we've gotten through run length encoding, dictionary coding. And then we'll talk a little bit about bitmap encoding, and compressing the bitmaps we talked about last time, and then we'll finish up with, with the, the last two. Okay. All right. So last class was all about using bitmaps as, as auxiliary data structures for indexes, right? But as the paper you guys read, you could actually just store the, the column itself natively as a bitmap, and actually that would compress it, right? assuming the cardinality is low enough. Uh, so. Again, this is an example of the same column we had before. If I just store it in the same with two, the same two bitmaps that I had, uh, then I, I can get you know the original data was 72 bits, and then if I get it down to this, it's 16 plus plus 18. All right, so 34 bits. That, that's a pretty good you know pretty good compression ratio. Um, question, sorry, oh, your, hand, your hands like up, sorry. Uh, you look cold. Also do. Um, <laughs> Right, so again, uh, this only, again, it only works if there's low cardinality. Again, we saw, we saw the zip code example. If I have a bunch of different possible values, I can maintain bitmaps for all of them. That's going to suck. Uh, we'll, we'll compress them in a second, but like, in general, you only want to do this when there's low cardinality. Now, I, I, we're not going to talk about this in, in this class, um, but there is additional optimization you can do where, depending on what the query is, uh, you may want to, you can order what bitmap you actually want to look at. Uh, like if you know some bitmap, if you know the query is trying to find something that matches a predicate, and you only need to find the first one, then maybe I'm going to choose the bitmap that's the most that has the most bits in it, because I'm more likely to find a match in there. And then wait, I, don't, I don't have to scan the other ones. Right? You, 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 data systems try to do the same thing for predicates, like where a a equals four and b equals five. It tries to evaluate the predicate that's going to be most selective first. It, so it's the same optimization here, but we can actually do within within a single attribute, a single column choosing what bitmap to use, which is kind of neat. All right, so how can we compress our bitmaps? As I said, there's going to be a lot of zeros in them. Because right? again, if it's a discrete value per bitmap, I can't have a 1 for one tuple. It can only appear in one of those bitmaps. So it means for all the other bitmaps, it's going to be a bunch of zeros. So we want to compress that down. So we could just use a naive compression scheme that we talked about before, Z standard or snappy and just compress the blocks that we're representing our bitmaps. But again, we have the same problem where the, the, now the compressed data is opaque, and I don't know what's in the bitmap until I decompress it. So that's less than ideal. So I want to talk about two other approaches, um, byte aligned bitmap codes from Oracle. And this is a way to do sort of what I'll call structured running from coding for, for bitmaps, where again, it's, the algorithm is designed for, based on the assumptions of what, what it knows the bitmaps are going to look like. And then we'll talk about roaring bitmaps um, that are, it's, came from this French-Canadian guy. This is more common in a bunch of different systems. And, and it's a simple, simple trick to, get, to compress things down. So I'll say also, too, the split is going to be, I, I like teaching about the Oracle stuff. It's from the 90s. It's slow. Nobody actually does it. Oracle doesn't even do it anymore. I, just, I, think, I think it's a really fascinating way to, again, to represent things. And the roaring bitmaps, though, is, is more common in modern systems. All right. So with the Oracle uh, byte aligned bitmap codes, BBC, what we're going to do is we're going to divide the bitmaps into chunks uh, based on different categories of bytes. And again, we're going to assume there'll be a bunch of zeros. So they're going to call uh, some sequence of, of a bunch of zeros as, as gap bytes. 
And then, we'll, then there'll be these tail bytes where some of the bits will be at least one. And the idea is we want to find these long sequences of a bunch of zeros, represent that with run length encoding, say here's, here's how long the, zeros, the, the, the bit sequence of zeros are. And then for the, for the tail bytes where there's at least one one, we're going to have different ways to represent them to indicate what's in them. Uh, and, and we can be clever about reducing the size of, of, of representing what's in those bitmaps based on the different patterns or, or bit sequences we can see. So we're going we're to chunk up our bitmap uh, that's going to be, uh, again, a long sequence of, of gap bytes in the beginning, followed by some number of tail bytes at the end. So the gap bytes, we're always going to compress to RLE, and then we'll store the, the tail bytes um, as uncompressed unless it has only one, uh, unless it has one byte that has at least one non zero bit, and we just say where the location of that bit is. Okay, well, I'm going to show the example to make more sense. All right, so here's, here's our bitmap. Again, so we have uh, some non, non zero uh, bits or non zero bytes here, one, one at the top and two at the bottom. And so the first chunk is going to be this, the, the, these first three chunk or three bytes here, all right, because we have all zeros and then, and then that tail byte. These, and again, these are the gap bytes. And then the next chunk will be this, this, this sequence here, because we have a bunch of zeros followed by the two at the end. So the way we sort this one first is that, again, in our header, we're going to keep track of the number of gap bytes we have. And then we have a, a one bit flag to say whether it's special or not, meaning, like, is it, is it, is there only one one in it, and we need to know the location of it. And then we can have information about the number of tail bytes we store in exact main, for, main format. So it looks something like this. So in the, in the, in the header byte, we have uh, the, the first three bits represent the number of gap bytes we have. So in this case, it's two, because we have, we have one, two. And then we have a bit here to say, is this thing special? Uh, and it's set to one, because there's only one in the tail byte. So that means in the next four bits, we just store, hey, where's the one? Right? So we went from now uh, three bytes down to one byte. So that's pretty good. Let's take this guy here. So we have, again, we have a, this long sequence of, of gap bytes and then two, uh, two tail bytes here. So we would have in the, the first, first three bits the number of uh, gap bytes, in the case 13. Then we have a zero to say the, it, the, the tail isn't special. Right? There isn't just you know, one byte with one, one bit. So then the next, uh, the, the, the next four bits tells us how many, how many bytes we're going to copy exactly here. Um, right? So I'm going through this. Yeah, there's the gap length. It tells you how, how many bits for the gap. There's the zero to say that we're not special. Here's the, bit that say, or the bytes that say uh, how many copies we have exactly at the bottom. And then there's our verbatim tail bytes. Yes? No, sorry. One, one, one is a flag to mean that hey, go look at the end of the, of the byte, and this will tell you the the, the gap length. How, how many? Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I messed that up. One, one, one is a special flag. Yeah. And then again, zero meaning we're not special. Uh, this is the the number of verbatim bytes we stored at the bottom, and then there's the actual verbatim tail bytes. So the original one was uh, 18 bytes, but then we got it down to five bytes. I think it's neat, right? It's like uh, it's like listening to old vinyl records. Like nobody does it anymore, but like it's sometimes it's it's a curiosity. Um, what's that? Some people listen to vinyl records. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's vintage. Yeah. This is a vintage encoding scheme. I, I like it, not because I made the slides. It's just because I think it's interesting. But it it's it's obviously bad. I'm gonna take a guess why. I think you close the door, sorry. It's highly, so you said it's highly data dependent? It depends on what your data has. If your data doesn't have a lot of zeros. Yeah, so his point is, if your data doesn't have a lot of zeros, then this doesn't work. But we said, we assume that it's going to be, right? If real workloads look like this. Real data sets look like this. If there are like consensus blocks that all have one, then that's To her point, like, yeah, if there's at least one one in, in these bytes, then this thing's going to be terrible. Right? But as I said, most real data sets are going to look like long sequences of, of zeros. 
from a computational standpoint, why is this bad in modern CPUs? Cheap. It's bad for, well, yeah, it's bad for SIMD, but what else? It's a lot of branching. A lot of branching, that's the answer, yes. So uh, this would be great for compression, but it has terrible branching, because as I'm looking at these bits, it's telling me, okay, do I need to jump ahead and look at the next thing, or should I, should I stay and look at my current bits? Even though everything's gonna be in L1, it's the, it's the CPU instructions that are, that, are, that are gonna be terrible. Because as I'm ripping through, at least in my example here, I had two, you know, two sequences, two chunks. This one, you just kind of rip through it. This one, you had to then jump around and find where things are. Like, this would be terrible for branch, branch prediction in the CPU because it's gonna be completely different maybe from one chunk to the next, all right? So this is why Oracle abandoned this in the, uh, in the 2000s and they've replaced it with this thing called word-aligned hybrid uh, bitmap encoding. This is all patented. Andy and patent, database patents don't mix, so we're not gonna cover it. Um, but again, they identified like in the 90s or like the 2000s for modern super stainless CPUs, and we'll see more about this throughout the semester, all this branching is going to be bad. It's going to be difficult to use SIMD because uh, you can't just take you know, arbitrary you know, if clauses and run that on SIMD. You have to do some kind of coding scheme similar to what we saw with the, uh, the bit weaving stuff. There's also, none of this can support random access. Less of an issue for us in OLAP, but like if I need to know exactly is some bit set to zero, I got to scan the entire thing and decompress it, the whole thing, all right? So a more common approach, or sorry, more modern approach is this thing called a roaring bitmap. And again, this is from this French Canadian guy named Daniel Lemire. His blog is actually very interesting. He's like a professor uh, who actually like writes a lot of code and puts out a thing on GitHub. He writes a lot of low-level low, low system code. So I highly encourage you to go check it out. Um, so, uh, the basic idea with the Roaring Bitmap is that we're going to store 30-bit integers in, uh, in a sort of complex or a compact two-level indexing structure, where sort of one you could have one chunk of data store things exactly with the exact values, but other ones maybe store that's more dense. You store it as a bitmap, right? And as I said, this is used in, in a bunch of different systems today. So here's the basic idea. So we say we have you know, four chunks. And then each, each chunk is going to point to some container that's going to store the, store the values. So say the first three chunks here, we're going to store the, the values in, in the, in exactly, right? If we put it in key four, we'll store key four here. But in, the, in this one here, if there's a lot of values within our, this, this chunk range, then we want to store it as a bitmap. So the idea, you can kind of be adaptive here. Like for some things, you'll store it exactly. Some things, if, it, if it's very sparse, but if something is very dense, Instead of storing the, all the exact values, I'll just store the bitmap to represent that. All right. So for each key we, we want to insert, we're first going to figure out what chunk it goes to by uh, dividing by two to the sixteen, and, and, and we store the key in only one chunk, one container. All right. And then the values are the number of unique values is less than 40, 40 and 96, and this is all going to be trying to be word aligned memory, or cache aligned. Then we're going to store it as just an array of values, just dependent one after another. Uh, whether or not you do sorting depends. I, it, I, I actually don't know what the implementation does. Um, but otherwise, if it's, it's a lot of values, then we're going to store it as, as a bitmap. So I, say I want to insert key, key 1000. So first thing I'll do is divide it by 2 to the 16th. So it tells me to go to this chunk here. And then uh, I'll just mod it, by, you know, bot, mod it by this. And that tells me where, where to go put it. So now I have another key like this. Uh, if I divide that by 2 to the 16, it tells me to go to this chunk here, but then now I can mod it and that tells me what offset I want to put my, uh, put my key in. Right? All right, so again, so set B number, B, the fifth bit, the 50th bit to, to 1. I don't know, again, we, we could read the, the, the paper, the blog article. I don't know when they decide when, you know, if it goes above 40 and 86, do you immediately convert it? If you go back down, do you convert it back? It, it, it depends on the implementation. Okay, so that's how to bitmap encoding. The, the, the last two schemes to talk about are delta encoding and then bit packing. So with, with delta encoding, again, it's exactly as it sounds. Assume that there's going to be a lot of uh, the, the values that we're storing sequentially in our column are going to be small, dairy, uh, small additions or su subtractions from the previous value. So instead of storing the whole value, I just have to store what is that delta. And then I'll be able to combine it with RLE uh, if I see the same sort of delta over and over again, 
to get even better compression. Right? So say I have a data set here where I'm keeping track of the, the at a given, every, every one minute, I'm keeping track of the temperature in the room. Or maybe actually outside, 99 is kind of hot in Fahrenheit, sorry. Right? So we'll say this will be the base value for the first entry we have in uh, the first tuple in, in our columns. So we'll store that in its original form. And then the subsequent columns will just be, what's the delta? Right? So if it's the time, it's one minute uh, over and over again. Right? So we just re repeat that. In the case of the, of the room temperature or the outside temperature, it's just you know, plus or minus some, some decimal. And of course, now what do we have here? We have a sequence of repeated values. So we just use RLE on that and compress that down even further. Right? And the reason why this is going to work is because assume that the thing that we're, we're, we're recording or tracking in the real world for, for these different columns is not going to have wild fluctuations. Right? It's like the temperature outside is, you know, is going to be 99 degrees now and then immediately go to, to negative 100. Right? So it's going to be sm small increments of each other. So same thing for the time. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. So in its original form, we were 160 bits. If we just do depth encoding, it's 96 bits. But then we apply RLE on top of that, then we get down to 64 bits. Of course, the tricky thing now is like, again, if I want to know what the exact value is at a given, given timestamp, uh, I can use, you know, use the RL thing to figure it out. Or since these are just increments of each other, I got to replay it and apply it, apply it back here. So there, there is some computational cost of trying to get back to the original values. But if I'm just scanning things and like, what is the average temperature? Uh, for some time range, assuming I have a zone map that tells me what the time range is, uh, otherwise I have to look at the time column, right? I can just scan through this and, and, and apply the changes to my, um, you know, to, to, to my, my hash table as I'm doing my aggregation. Okay. All right, so the last scheme is, is bit packing and then the, the redshift uh, variation called uh, mostly encoding. And the idea here is that if the data system can recognize that even though the application told it that a given column should be stored as a certain data type, like a 32-bit in integer, 64-bit integer, but if, we, if it recognizes that the values you're actually storing for that column are way smaller than the actual possible range of values you could have, then instead of storing the, the exact bits you would need to represent the value based on the defined type, I could store it in, 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 a, in a smaller type. Right? It's sort of obvious, right? So say I have a column here, a bunch of integers, we saw last class, and the user defined this as a 32-bit integer column. It's super common, right? People define a you know, serial ID or uh, integer data type, right? They may not know about small int or tiny int in SQL. So I have 32-bit integers, but if I actually look at the, the bits for these values I'm showing here, I'm actually st I can store these actually in 8 bits because the values themselves aren't that large. So we have all this, these bits here uh, that are completely wasted, right? So the data system recognizes this and says, yeah, I'll tell you it's 32 bits, but underneath the covers, I'm actually going to represent this as 8 bits. Now, this is nicely memory aligned, but you could actually go even smaller, right? If you can do some, something that you know, is like 7 bits or 6 bits, and there's techniques using the similar to the things we saw in bit weaving where like we were putting values in a, in a single 30 bit two values in a single 30 bit integer and then doing some tricks to do uh, our operations on top of them we can do the same things if we're start packing things as like four bits or five bits right for for simplicity i'm showing is is eight bits All right so the original value with eight 32 bit integers is 236 bits but with with bit packing we can get it down to eight bits yes Yeah, so her statement is, okay, this is great, but what if the user comes along and inserts something that's not eight, more than 8 bits? So if it's immutable, they can't, right? So that solves this problem. If it's not, then you have to, be, you have to do something else. That's mostly encoding. This, so this is what Redshift calls it. I don't know who else does this. Um, but the idea here is that, say that most of my data will fit into the smaller, smaller data type, but there's... Some, so some bad eggs, a few, few values that don't actually fit. Right, so say this one, you know, it's a 30-bit integer column, but there's this one value here that's super large. Right, whether or not that's inserted later on or whether or not it was in the original data we looked at, it doesn't matter. So what we're going to do is we'll store it as mostly 8 bits, 
But then we'll have a sort of special marker here, some bit sequence to say, oh, by the way, the value that you want at this offset in my column isn't actually being stored here. There's a separate other table over here that, where you can go get it. Right? It's, it's like dictionary encoding to say, hey, don't look here for what you're looking for. Look in this other dictionary and get, get the original value. Right? So in this case here, again, originally we were 256 bits, but it would do mostly encoding. Uh, we still store, have to store all eight bits for all the values here, because even, even the, the flag, the marker here, takes space. And then, the, um, and then they have the, the actual dictionary itself. So I'm showing my example here that this is just like some, like say maybe it's all ones, right? Uh, you could, well, actually, you could store a bit and say where to go find it uh, and, with one bit, and then the, the remaining bits tell you what the offset is inside of this. I don't think they do that. I think it's just like all, all ones, and oh, by the way, go, go look over here. All right? Okay. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the intermediate results. And this, I don't have diagrams to, to show this. Uh, I, I can visualize, it, visualize this next class. So when we start talking about joins and other things, this, this might make more sense. But the whole point of this exercise, this class and the last class, was trying to reduce the cost of doing sequential scans. And the indexes and the filters allow you to say, I don't need to read this data because uh, I know something about what's inside of it based on my predicates. I, I don't need to look at it. The things we're talking about today is if the data I do have to go read, how can I keep it comp compressed, compact, so that the, the amount of data I'm fetching in, is, there's, I'm getting more bang for the buck again, I'm getting more useful tuples out of it to do my evaluation for every I.O. that I'm doing, but also too in some cases I can speed up execution if I can operate still directly on compressed data. Right? Maybe not have to look at the real data, look at the dictionary or something else. But once we get past that basic sequential scan operation, as far as I know, every database system is going to then pass along from one operator to the next always in a decompressed form. So even though that I can operate in, in my predicates directly on the compressed data without having to have to decompress it, then when I pass it to the next operator, it has to be decompressed. And ideally, of course, that the, ideally I am, uh, my predicate is selective enough where I'm throwing away a lot of data, so the amount of data I have to do de decompress is small, but I still have to be decompressed the next operator. And this is because the we don't want to have the repeated uh, logic throughout the execution engine for the, all these different operators, like the group buys, the sorting, the joins. We don't want to repeat logic or make calls to our decompression libraries to operate on decompressed data. Ideally, we only want to have the, from a software engineering standpoint, only the lower levels of the execution engine, or the lower parts of the, the, of the query plan, that's where the decompression logic actually is. But everything up, can, everything up above can still operate on, uh, on, on decompressed data. Again, you have to do this because again, you don't want to repeat the logic, but also you can't guarantee that the data coming from one source versus another source in the leaf nodes, or even within the same table, is going to be compressed in the same way. So my example here would be a do and join in two hash tables, or to do and hash join in two tables. Right? If I'm, my hash table I build, the, the build side, if I'm storing the compressed values inside of the hash table, I have to then make sure on the probe side that table is, is then reconverted back into or recompressed into uh, the same dictionary scheme that the, the, the build side was on. But now, again, how do I do that if I'm reading in multiple blocks and multiple files that each have their own dictionary? It just becomes like intractable, right? And again, I, I, I could try to do an incremental scheme where like I decompress every bun, then, then I recompress it as, as it's going into the hash table, but that starts to get expensive and it becomes logistically difficult. Especially if the maybe the data is coming from different nodes in a distributed system. So for this reason, once you get past the scan and any basic predicate evaluation, the data is uncompressed going up. Because it's just, again, from, from a software engineering standpoint and a computational standpoint, it's just easier. Okay? Okay. So that's what I have today. Again, this is, a, this is sort of the last class we'll have on, uh, at the storage layer. Everything above or everything going forward in the next semester is going to be, okay, how do we actually take the data we, we just decompressed or found through indexes and actually make it run, you know, run the queries on them, all right? So dictionary encoding, as I said, is the most common one. It, it may not be always the most effective one because there's obviously, uh, you know, RLE would be 
the, RLE is probably going to be the, get the best compression ratio, but again, it only really works if things are sorted. And so in general, the, the, the dictionary encoding is, is good enough in most cases. And as, as I said, we can combine different, different techniques, as we talked about today, within the dictionary itself uh, to, get, to get better results. Yes? Keep it compressed, and yeah. so that so. Yeah, so th th there's two things. There's late materialization, as in like when do I stitch back the tuple back together from the different columns, and then at what point do I decompress it? So they make a big deal. The papers written in 2006 in C store that like you want to keep things depressed as long as possible. Vertica is the commercial implementation of that, and they they got rid of that. And as far as I know, system does that. Um, I forget, I actually don't know Vertica's compression schemes. I know they have used RLE. I don't know what the scope of their dictionary is, right? So if the dictionary is on the, on the entire column, then yeah, you can, you can do that. But if, the, if you have blocks of things, then the, the dictionary is different from each block. It's, it, the, the codes aren't going to match up. So you got to convert it. And then, and then are you going to spend time then rebuild a new dictionary and recode things again? Nobody, nobody does that because you might have to spell it a disk. And that's, once you're writing intermediate results out, is your processing query? That's the death, death of the query. I mean, it'll still run. It just becomes slow. You want to keep things in memory as long as possible, uh, and so not having to stage intermediate results with like pipeline breakers is is going to be the best case scenario. Yeah, the, I, I can post a link on Piazza. There's a follow-up paper from the Vertica people, basically, of like, okay, since since C store ten years later, here's all the things we learned. And, that, and that's in there. They talk about how they, they got rid of that late materialization for compression. OK. I mean, to, to Chi's question he asked me earlier today was like, OK, why? We've read the last two papers that were on C Store. They're from 2006, 2007. I just told you that they're, you know, the, I just said, like, oh, yeah, the, the things they talk about, people don't actually do anymore. Why do they have you guys read those papers? Because those are the fundamental papers on column stores and, and compression. And the basic ideas that they describe in the paper, that's what everyone else is, is based upon. There's, there's nuances to them that, that we'll talk about, and I can mention as we go along, like, OK, they said this, but here's actually really want to do it. Things evolve over time, of course, as hardware changes and workload changes and, and, and you know, cloud absolutely changes a lot of things, as we talked about in the very beginning. Um, but the fundamental ideas is, are, are still sound, right? Relational models from the 70s, but there isn't, you know, that is the best thing to do. In, in most, in most, in, in almost every single case. Okay. All right. So next class, we'll talk about query execution. Again, it will be about how do we actually take a query plan. I haven't told you. We haven't told us how we're going to create the query plan. That'll come later. But how do we take a query plan, execute it, and then move data uh, up up the query plan tree to produce a, a result. Okay. All right, guys. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I could do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so yeah, I'm a fool because I drink fruit. Quick the bus, a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watts, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>